This is a talk on treating Crohn's disease with a whole food diet given by gastroenterologist Dr. Alan Desmond at the Glasgow Health Conference in June 2018. Um, I'm Dr. Alan Desmond. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist and the lead for inflammatory bowel disease at my trust in South Devon. Um, we're going to start on a little bit of a specialised topic, which is inflammatory bowel disease, specifically Crohn's disease. It's a bit of a niche topic, but I think it's a really good um, example of why the kind of standard uh, low fibre, high fat, animal heavy diet contributes to or exacerbates disease and why a whole food plant-based diet may be the solution to that problem. So it's very illustrative of other disorders. What is Crohn's disease? Well, Crohn's disease is a type of inflammatory bowel disease whereby people develop damaged inflamed patches within their bowel. So you can see some normal healthy bowel looks a bit like the lining inside your cheek. It's pink and soft and healthy. In Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease, you get segments which are really inflamed with ulcers and these parts of the bowel just are not working very well. The inflammation can affect any part of the digestive tract. We often see patients with patches in their small bowel or their large bowel, but it can affect any part of your gastrointestinal tract. And not only does the bowel get inflamed, but over time, as you can see in this segment of bowel, you can get these areas which become strictured and narrowed. You can get inflammation and infection outside the bowel, leading to abscesses deep in your body. So it's a very unpleasant problem to have. Only about 10% of patients with Crohn's disease get sustained and long-term remission. So most people are living with symptoms and half of patients require surgery within 10 years of their diagnosis. And often that surgery is to remove diseased segments of their bowel and they're still not cured. They still have the disease and there's a chance it will come back. So this diagram shows the clinical course of patients with Crohn's disease. The black um, line on the end popping up and down is when the inflammation is active and the patients experience symptoms and they're having a flare and that goes on for years and years and years. The pink line which is gradually increasing shows that in the background their bowel is being damaged over the years so even if they feel pretty well there's still silent damage going on which leads to stricturing and leads to surgery. As you can imagine if you have Crohn's disease it really affects your quality of life. Patients have dreadful digestive symptoms, weight loss, they develop abscesses, they can suffer from malabsorption and malnutrition, and what we doctors euphemistically call failure to thrive. Being absent from work or absent from school is incredibly common, and only about a quarter of patients with Crohn's disease describe themselves as being in excellent or good health. I'm not going to spend too much on this slide because we could do a whole symposium on this. So these are the medications that we use to treat Crohn's disease and I prescribe these medications all the time and they've revolutionized the lives of patients with Crohn's disease. So the top drug is corticosteroids. So if you're in the midst of an acute flare, you'll get a course of high dose oral steroids. And the next drug is azathioprine, so that's an immune modulator drug that will help you to stay off steroids if you're requiring a lot of steroids. And then as you get sicker, or if you get sicker, we have the newer drugs, the infliximabs, adalimumabs, these um, anti-TNF drugs and other forms of drugs, which help to keep the disease under control. All of these drugs act by changing your immune system essentially. And while they're very good and very helpful, the two columns on the right side here just show how likely you are to get into remission. I mean complete remission when you're on these medications. And the numbers are disappointing. We're talking 33, 45%. So even with these great medications, we have a lot of patients who are not in remission. So if you don't understand how we treat Crohn's disease, you need to know a little bit about what causes Crohn's disease. On the left hand side, we have a normal healthy bowel lining, which separates your body from what's inside your gut. It's a barrier, and that barrier is made up of a layer of mucus, a line of epithelial cells, which are kept together by these little tight junctions, which keeps it all tight and impermeable. And this barrier interacts with the contents of your gut, including bacteria. On the right hand side, you've got someone with inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's disease. The mucus layer is depleted. There's lots of bacteria adhering to the cells and passing through the cells. The tight junctions are loose. Stuff is getting in 
and the immune system is reacting to it, causing damage. When I was in medical school, we were taught that Crohn's disease was all about genetics, that you got bad luck in the genetic lottery, you've got bad genes, your immune system is attacking your gut, so you're sick. There is a role of genetics. What we understand now is that the genetics are there, but they only account for about 15 to 25% of the variability in the disease. What really drives the disease is environmental exposures. And of course, the greatest environmental exposure that we get on a daily basis, 300, four or five times a day, is the food that we eat. The fact that inflammatory bowel disease has been increasing in prevalence over the 20th century and early 21st century has led Nature magazine or Nature, Nature Journal to describe this as a slow motion epidemic. Crohn's disease, when it was, when it was described in the 30s, was a really rare uh, diagnosis, but it exploded in Western countries in the latter 20th century as our diet and lifestyles changed. <laughs> In the 21st century, uh, Crohn's disease affects about one in 300 people in Germany and about one in 300 people in Canada. This is now an incredibly common disorder. It's almost that common in the UK. And through the late 20th century in newly industrialized countries like Africa, Asia, Brazil, Taiwan, we saw the prevalence of Crohn's disease increasing as dietary patterns changed. So most of these patients don't have a genetically loaded gun and the human genetic code hasn't changed dramatically in the last 30 to 50 years, yet Crohn's disease is now a slow epidemic. When I see new patients with Crohn's disease and I explain the nature of this, the disorder, they're going to need endoscopies and scans, they've got inflammation, they may need surgery, there's drugs that, that can work quite well. They always ask, well, what about diet, doc? Because they know the food they eat can influence their symptoms and they want answers. They need to get evidence-based recommendations. And we also know that the majority of patients, 95% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, are a little bit scared of food. They don't know what they should eat, they don't know what's good for them, they don't know what's bad for them. Again, they want answers and it's difficult when they sit down at the table and they're offered food to know, well, is this going to help? Is this not going to help? But the evidence is out there and I'm going to give you a little tour of the evidence just now. So fiber, we get fiber from plants and fiber protects you from developing Crohn's disease. In the Harvard's nurses study, we saw that women with a higher intake of fiber had a significantly reduced risk of developing Crohn's disease. We've seen a similar study from Canada, and these are just two of many studies that show that children with a higher intake of dietary fiber are much less likely to develop inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease. So why would fiber from plants protect you from Crohn's disease? Well, we've got an observation and we have tons of plausible biological mechanisms. We know that soluble fiber helps to reduce inflammation in the lining of the bowel. We know that soluble fiber helps to maintain the integrity of the epithelial barrier that we looked at earlier. There may also be more to the fiber story. The fact that eating a lot of fiber helps may also be because alongside the fiber, of course, you're getting plants. You're getting phytonutrients. For example, the indoles found in fruits and cruciferous vegetables have been shown to reduce gut inflammation in models of Crohn's disease. Now, a lot of patients with Crohn's disease are on a very low fiber diet and they've been recommended a very low fiber diet. And many clinicians are scared to get them to put a bit of fiber into their diet. This is just one study, it's small, 11 patients with moderately active Crohn's disease who were on the traditional very low fiber diet. And in this study, they just gave them three grams of insoluble and nine grams of soluble fiber per day. And all 11 patients reported improvement in their symptoms and improvement in their overall quality of life. And that study was actually really nice to read because the feedback from the patients was so positive. It's a small numbers in that study, but it does demonstrate the concept, yet low fiber diet is standard advice given to patients with Crohn's disease. We're all about evidence-based medicine, and if you go and look for an evidence-based study looking at the benefits of being on a low fiber diet and Crohn's disease, you've got to go back to the 1980s to find the last time somebody studied it. And what did they find? They found no difference. A low fiber diet didn't help at all. In fact, it might have made things a little bit worse. One more comment on fiber. Here's a landmark study from gut 2010. One of the abnormal things we see in the gut of people with Crohn's disease is that parts of their gut transport uh, damaging bacteria called E. coli, um, adherent invasive uh, E. coli. It sticks onto the gut lining cells, gets transported inside, 
and then generates an immune response. We don't see that in healthy individuals. But when these researchers took the guts for patients with Crohn's disease and exposed it to this E. coli, and then also, and then also exposed it to dietary levels of soluble plant fiber from plantain and broccoli, they saw a 70% decrease in the translocation of the harmful bacteria. And then when they exposed that same uh, setup to polysorbate 80, which is an emulsifier that you'll find in dairy foods or any food that tastes creamy, that because it's been made to taste creamy artificially, they found that they doubled the invasion of these harmful E. coli. And those authors, and those authors wrote to the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis and said emulsifiers are causing Crohn's disease. And they showed this diagram, which shows that the more emulsifiers a country consumes, the more likely the higher prevalence of Crohn's disease. But of course, I think they're right, but I think it's just part of the part of the uh, problem. I've shown some uh, almond milk there because you can get your emulsifiers in almond milk as well. You don't have to be eating ice cream to get emulsifiers. Moving on from the emulsifiers, maltodextrin. It's an artificial sugar added to tons and tons of foods. I'd be surprised if there's anyone in this room who hasn't eaten maltodextrin recently. What these researchers showed on the top slide there, you've got human um, cells in the gut with E. coli adhering. You add maltodextrin and there's so much more adherence of E. coli. Our findings demonstrate that maltodextrin enhances bacterial adhesion and suggests a mechanism by which consumption of this dietary additive may promote disease in susceptible individuals. Moving on to animal fat and animal protein, I talked earlier about countries in the world where Crohn's disease and IBD exploded in the 20th century. Japan is a good example. Here we have researchers in 1996 that looked very closely at changing dietary patterns in Japan and compared that to the increasing incidence of Crohn's disease. Their conclusion? Increased dietary intake of animal protein and N6 omega uh, fatty acids with less N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids may contribute to the development of Crohn's disease. And they found a very strong correlation with increasing animal protein consumption. We don't have to go as far as Japan. We can see the same outcome from France. Here's uh, a study for published in 20, uh, 2010 where they followed tens of thousands of healthy women for about 10 years, looked at what they were eating and drinking and their diet and lifestyle if they had a high protein intake, particularly a high animal protein intake, they were three times more likely to develop Crohn's disease during that 10 year period. So what about dairy? The studies I showed earlier show that yes, dairy is associated with an increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease. And there's been multiple, multiple studies demonstrating that high fat and high milk fat diets can induce or exacerbate Crohn's and colitis type diseases by multiple mechanisms, reducing the mucus layer, increasing inflammation, increasing TNF-alpha secretion, improving the invasive ability of these harmful bacteria, and perhaps more importantly, inducing unfavorable changes in the gut microbiome. A little bit on the gut microbiome and Crohn's disease. Here's a beautiful study from 2014 um, where researchers took healthy people who were on a pretty standard omnivorous diet. For four days only, they switched them to a completely plant-based diet. Then they gave them a break, back to normal. And then for another four days, they put them on an animal-based diet. The animal-based diet was very low fiber, very high fat, and very high in animal protein. The plant-based diet was the opposite. And what did they see? Within a day, they saw dramatic changes in the composition and function of the gut microbiome. And their conclusion was that they had seen an outgrowth of microorganisms capable of triggering inflammatory bowel disease. And this is just four days on a carnivore diet. The no food approach is well uh, documented and standard of care in Crohn's disease, particularly children with Crohn's disease. For years and years, pediatricians have been putting patients with Crohn's disease, uh, children, on an artificial feeding regimen. So this is exclusive enteral nutrition. Basically, you're only allowed to take these sort of shakes 
for food. This is an artificial food product originally developed by NASA. It contains the basic building blocks of food, which are really easily digested. So there isn't that much passing on further down your digestive tract. And it works, and it works better than steroids in children. It also works very well in adults. It's being used more in adults now. But it tastes terrible. It's not a long-term solution. It's very difficult to get children to maintain this long-term. It's even more difficult to get adults to maintain it long-term. And for years, we've been trying to figure out why does it work? Is there something magic in there? But what we now realize, it's not what's in that, art, that food product that they're being given. It's what's not in it that excludes these potentially harmful foods that we just mentioned. Most of it isn't in that product. So the question is, can we get that same benefit by putting people on a whole food diet that meets the criteria that excludes these harmful foods. Well, two fantastic studies, 2014 and 2017, where they did just that and showed that you can treat active Crohn's disease successfully with a diet that restricts animal protein and animal fat, restricts N6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, restricts dairy, emulsifiers, and food additives whilst providing dietary fiber. And have you ever seen a better description of a whole food plant-based diet? So in this study, they uh, reported on 68 patients. Some of them were newly diagnosed. Uh, in the second paper, there were patients who'd had Crohn's disease for a number of years and were on lots of the medications we talked about earlier, but still getting sicker. These are patients that we really struggle with. These are the patients who are really tough to get better. All of the patients were in a moderate to severe flare-up of their um, disease. And they asked those patients for six weeks to eat half their calories from the um, food product we talked about earlier, the elemental feed, but to take half of their calories from a specifically designed whole food diet, which was predominantly plant-based. Interestingly, some of the patients still wouldn't take the formula, so they were just given the predominantly plant-based diet. Now, what happened? Well, it was dramatic. In the newly diagnosed patients after six weeks, Almost 80% of patients had shown significant clinical response and 70% were in remission. Now, if you think about the slide we showed a few minutes ago, 30, 40% in remission, we've got 70% in remission. And this is without medication. And their results were maintained right out to week 12. We don't have a long-term study to quote yet. And when we turn to the established patients, these are patients who've been around for a number of years, they've got some digestive tract damage, they're on various strong medications already, and they're still getting sick. They had similar, very encouraging results. You see biomarkers improving. And at, at week six, 90% of the patients were feeling substantially better. And you see clinical measures of disease activity improving, and 62% were in complete clinical remission. Now, 62% might not sound great, but believe me, as a gastroenterologist, that's incredibly exciting, because it's really hard to get these patients into remission. They reported on 18 patients who only had the whole food diet, they didn't have the uh, enteral nutrition, and 77% of them got into remission. It's phenomenal. Turning to another study, this is a study from a few years ago in Japan, where they took patients off a kind of a westernized diet who had Crohn's disease. These patients had all just had a significant flare of their Crohn's disease and had gotten into remission by traditional means. And then they were randomized to eat a semi-vegetarian diet or to eat a standard omnivorous diet. Small numbers in the study, but they followed these patients for a very long time. And they showed that the semi-vegetarian diet achieved long-term remission rates better than any reported drug trial in Crohn's disease. But that was a small trial, and the author of that trial did write the Permanente Journal uh, a few years later when they did a special edition on the benefits of plant-based nutrition, and said, evidence level of our study is not enough to make gastroenterologists appreciate the efficacy of a plant-based diet in IBD. Clinical studies providing high level of evidence showing the efficacy of plant-based diet in IBD are eagerly awaited. And those studies are coming out, and gladly, in the last few months, we've received funding at my hospital to do just that. So hopefully, later this year, we'll be putting patients with Crohn's disease on a plant-based diet and monitoring them very closely. <coughs> this stuff is becoming mainstream. A lot of patients contact me and say, oh, I've heard you talk, I've seen, I've seen what you're saying, but my gastroenterologist doesn't believe me. So this is really exciting. This is from the current edition of GUT, which is one of the big journals, one of the major journals in inflammatory bowel disease and gastroenterology. 
And this paper is available online now. You can only get it if you subscribe to the uh, journal. But if you have a gastroenterologist or you've got a friend with inflammatory bowel disease and they've got a gastroenterologist, please ask them to read this paper. When my patients with inflammatory bowel disease ask for dietary advice, I give them evidence-based recommendations. I tell them to include some dietary fiber, particularly soluble fiber, to include fruit and vegetables, to make sure they're getting their N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. I tell them to cut down or completely eliminate red meat and saturated meat, or sorry, or red meat and processed meat, and I really try and get them eating very little meat indeed if they're up for it. I ask them to avoid dairy and dairy fats, which is easy because they already know it makes them feel poorly. So a lot of them have already stopped it or have been thinking about stopping it. And I ask them to avoid rich sources of N6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. We haven't talked about the um, evidence behind excess fruit juices and processed sugars today, but I also ask them to cut those out. And I ask them to eat whole foods, plant-based, they need to get the artificial emulsifiers, the polysorbate 80, the carrageenans, the carboxymethylcelluloses, and all these things that are manufactured and added to foods. And they need to cut out the artificial sweeteners, and they need to cut out mal maltodextrin, and this is evidence-based. Or to put that really simply, I ask my patients to eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Thanks very much.